Welcome everybody to the third day of the 2020 Virtual Government UX Summit. We're going to be getting started shortly. As a reminder, this event is being recorded. While I'm telling you the getting started stuff, please go into the chat and tell us what agency or organization you're from. There, you're also going to find a link to live captioning as well as other useful links. We've had a great program so far this year, and I'm really excited to hear from our colleagues in government across the country. A big shout out to everybody who's made this possible, including my fabulous co-chair, Jean Fox, the staff at GSA who are hosting us and doing all of the logistics to make this possible, everyone who submitted fabulous proposals and made it so hard for our volunteers who provided peer pr review and program planning, and all of our presenters who are taking time to share their experiences with us, our session chairs, and all of you who are attending the sessions today. We've got a great program, and there's still one more session after this. If you're not already signed up for it, it's not too late. Go and sign up if you'd like to attend. This summit has been organized by the User Experience Community of Practice and Digital.gov. The mission of digital.gov is to transform how government learns, builds, delivers, and measures digital services in the 21st century. They do that by providing people in the federal government with the tools, methods, practices, and policy guidance they need to de deliver effective and accessible digital services. The user experience community of practice provides resources to help those doing UX work at all levels of the US government. It is open to anyone who has an interest in UX and a government email address. You'll find information on joining the community in the chat window. A few more things before we get going. Videos of the presentations will be available online in about two weeks. At the end of this session, you'll see a link to a survey and we appreciate you filling out the survey. It will help us make future summits even better. Direct all your questions to the chat. You won't be able to unmute yourself, so if you have a question for the presenter, put it in the chat and the session chair will relay it to her at the end when we have Q&A. As a final reminder, this is being recorded. And now, let me introduce Christy Hermanson. She's been working with GSA's Integrated Award Environment since 2013, first as a contractor, and since 2016 as a federal employee. Although much of her background is technical, she first served as the Integrated Award Environment Performing User Analysis. She learned the program through the eyes of the IAE's customers. She has engaged with and analyzed user input from thousands of IAE customers. Christy, take it away. Thank you, Wendy. And also thank you, Jean, for, uh, you, you know, we all were hit with this pandemic, you know, su surprise and um, for taking and pulling this off as a virtual event. I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to, to share this, um, this presentation today. So thank, thank you very much. Change is hard. In the early 20th century, almost nobody in this country brushed their teeth. Think about that for a second. 7% <laughs> of households in the country had a tube of toothpaste in their medicine cabinet. At the same time, Americans were consuming more and more processed sugary foods, dental health was declining, and nobody brushed their teeth. So an executive named Claude Hopkins, who was a formative influence in the advertising industry, was approached about putting together a national ad campaign for Pepsodent. And he believed that selling toothpaste was financial suicide. You would never convince people to change their habits and start brushing their teeth. But he agreed to design a national marketing campaign anyway. And in doing his research, he discovered that teeth are covered what, with what he called a film. You can get rid of it by eating an apple. Toothpaste doesn't necessarily get rid of it. But in spite of this, Hopkins used this to get people to change their habits and start brushing their teeth using a simple trigger. 
Just run your tongue across your teeth. About three weeks after the ad campaign first ran, demand exploded and his campaign was considered wildly successful. Still, a decade later, 35% of Americans still didn't have a tube of toothpaste in their medicine cabinet. That just gives you some sense, 10 years. Um, you, know, you look back now and you think, you can't imagine people not brushing their teeth. But that type of change over the course of 10 years to get just 65% of the American population to brush their teeth as a habit. I think just really illustrates for me just how difficult change can be, how long change can take sometimes, and, and really how, how hard it is. Because of this, I think, you know, it's, it's never too early to consider how change is going to impact your customers. You know, and when we talk about you know, human-centered design and customer experience, I think it's really important to, to consider the change management aspect of that as its own human-centered design challenge and how we really need to be intentional about that and really treat it like, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get into software development a little bit and building software systems, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about things like Agile, where we have these well-established iterative processes for going in and trying to go and reach our end state. But how really throughout that entire process, leading your, considering the changes and really what kind of changes you're taking people through, talking to people about what those changes are and really making them active participants in the change that you're taking them through is, is such a critical part, I think, of, of particularly the kinds of sweeping changes that I'm gonna talk about that we've been making. So this picture right here shows a little bit of the environment that I work in. And I work for GSA's Integrated Award Environment. We're responsible for what was 10 government-wide award systems. That's contracting systems and uh, federal assistance like grants support systems. So we have things like contract opportunities, Government-wide, again, um, agencies will put out contract opportunities on one of our old websites called fbo.gov, and uh, vendors would go in and, and bid on those. Um, we have past performance data. When contracts are made, we have all of those award actions. We have sub-award data. On the assistance side, we have something called assistance listings, which are program descriptions. We have entity registration where vendors and state governments and anyone who really gets um, any sort of award from the federal government goes in and registers themselves. So the idea behind this is to go in and connect all of this data together so that the award data is connected to the vendor data, the opportunities connected to the agency data, and all of this is playing together. And the end state really is, is the vision is a really powerful tool where everything is seamless and, and connected. So if you look at the um, graph on the left there, that shows we have, um, we have a, we are partway through this transition right now. The uh, systems with the green background, uh, CFDA, PEEPERS, WDOL, and FBO are systems that have been decommissioned already. Everything that you see in the blue background are systems that we have yet to, um, to decommission or transition. So, um, so CFDA, WDOL, and FBO right now have been brought into a single environment. And that graph that you see in the lower left-hand corner shows you a feedback that came in. We have a feedback tool on this integrated site. And you can see the feedback coming in, and this is the number of, of of feedback items that we received. And you see that huge spike there um, in the middle where it says 9919, 9, almost 10,000 comments. And that corresponds with the month that FBO retired. So you can see there's a little bit of traffic sort of ramping up to that. And then you see this huge spike of people reacting to the change that we made. So 
So this is a little bit about, we have a lot of different types of stakeholders. Um, we've got a lot of governance and regulatory bodies, but then even within our user community, it spans everything from a really small nonprofit that might be a one or two person operation to a large state government to a large federal contractor. So really different um, types of users with really different needs. So that adds some complexity there. And then something else to think about too, if you look at the, uh, the bell curve there in the lower left hand corner, this is, comes out of a book uh, called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore, and it's really a marketing book. And it talks about, about um, trying to get people and really how you get people to adopt innovative technology. And I think one of the things that's really interesting in the federal government with systems like ours, and I think a lot of others as well, is that this bell curve that shows sort of the natural progression from early adopters all you know through the early majorities is that blue in the center and then you've got the late majority um, which is the next block and then you've got the laggards which are the last people to want to adopt technology or innovation when we have an authoritative federal system we have that entire body of users that we're essentially telling okay you know what you need to adopt all of this right now so if you think about you know we transitioned um, fed biz ops which is the contract opportunity system that we have over a weekend in november which means that when all of these people regardless of whether or not they're they're people who really embrace innovation or people who really want things to be much more stable before they adopt a new technology all of those people that use our systems when they left work on friday afternoon they had one system that was the authoritative system for contract opportunities and when they came into work on Monday morning, they had a completely different environment that was now that authoritative system. So we are taking really all of those people across that entire bell curve because these are mandatory systems. You know, if you want to do business with the federal government, you have to use our stuff. We are taking all of those people and really making that huge leap together. And if you think about that, it's, it's really sort of a, an astounding thing to get your mind around that, um, that something that has this natural progression out in the marketplace, we're really doing that in a very much you know, shortened time frame and really just bringing everything, everyone forward together. Huge challenge. So we've had a human-centered design program in place for a long time, probably dating back to, well, really, you know, because we have so many people who use our system and so much governance, we've been talking to stakeholders since before we really had a formal program. But probably around the maybe 2016 timeframe is when we really started to formalize things more. We worked with the lab over at OPM and did 100% training for all of our program office staff at that time based on the four to five day training that they were offering on human-centered design. Really great program, by the way. We made very few tweaks to it in bringing it into our environment. And then we periodically hold refreshers internally. We don't have a lot of turnover in our staff, which has been really nice, but we hold refreshers periodically in, in different types of workshops on this as well. So we've had this, um, this program going for a long time. Um, and we've also taken, we do a scaled agile development using scaled agile framework, um, which really means that we're meeting every eight weeks and um, reviewing where we're at, um, taking and adjusting our, our priorities, um, doing all of that analysis. And we really have, you can see this, our agile um, and this is a straight, you can go out online, look up scaled agile framework, look at the portfolio Kanban, and you can see the steps that we've implemented um, where things first, new ideas go into a funnel, we review them, they go into analysis. At that point, once they're approved to move forward, they go into a backlog where a development team can pick up that work, implement it, and then ready really means that it's getting pushed to an alpha environment. But we've taken and, and you can see how forward stack this is with all the human-centered design processes really in those first few stages and this is a process that we've had going for a while like i said but a lot of the focus on this was really 
on the end state, right? So an example might be, how do we enable small businesses to identify contracts that they're well suited to compete for? And really, what is the end state system that we want that's gonna make it easy for them to do that? And that was really the type of problem solving that we were focusing on. Instead of, instead of taking a look at that end state and saying, okay, now that we know where we want people to end up, what are the incremental things that we can do along the way to make that transition easy for them? Which really is a design problem in its own right. And there are places without, throughout this framework where you can really insert some of those types of questions, particularly in the framing of your problems, you know, as you're going through and, and talking to people in focus groups and interviews and, and having a good sense of where they're coming from and, and what steps they think they need to take to get to that end state. Um, and then as you're going in and, and prototyping and going out and soliciting feedback on that, and we do have a fairly robust prototype process in place, um, taking and, and really being very explicit and very intentional when you're going through those experiences and, and asking people, okay, if this is where we really want to be with this system, then how do you want us to get you there? So this is a little bit um, of what our end state vision was that we really were initially focused on. And if you take a look at this picture right here and then go back to this one here, these are really, really different pictures. This one, we've got 10 different siloed systems, each with a fairly focused um, you know, positioning, you know, what it did, a, a focused mission and we're taking these 10 systems and turning into something that really is conceptually organized like this. You know, part of the point in bringing all these systems together is to really connect the data so that when you're searching through records, you can search for all the records on, say, a company. So you can look for their award data, you can look for their entity data, um, their, their registration information, if you have the right privileges, you can look for their performance information. So the idea was that we really wanted to have a unified search. One, it's, it's much more efficient to build a single search experience. It becomes very consistent for people. And then we can really start to connect the data to be able to search across all these different systems. Um, if you look at the data bank you know, on the far left, where we wanted to really have a single area of reports and that way, you know, we each each of the legacy systems has their own reports, and you know, for our MVP, we have to get to the point where um, where we have those reports in place. But then we can start to build on that and make connections between the data and really build reports that span data sets. So, in order to really achieve and really get to the vision, this this is what enables us to do that but it's also really, really different from what people were used to. So we spent a lot of time, you know, years um, working on getting all of this infrastructure in place, getting single sign-on in place, getting a consolidated role management, looking at roles across all the systems, trying to standardize terminology, a ton of focus on how do we really make these systems consistent? How do we make them work together? How do we standardize functionality behaviors across all of this? And we didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about, you know, how really different this looked to users. And, you know, you find yourself in this position where you kind of feel like, okay, we can change nothing and, and then nothing ever gets better or change is going to be hard and you're sort of caught between, okay, do we do nothing or do we make the change and, and know that it's going to be hard? Um, and, and that's really, I think, a little bit of our mindset in a lot of those early discussions where we're like, okay, we know this is going to be hard, but hard is better than doing nothing. And so when we first transitioned CFDA, we didn't ask a lot of those questions like, you know, okay, yeah, it's going to be hard, but how do we soften that landing? So when we first put CFDA out there, we had the new experience. It was vastly different. We went in, we did training, um, 
you know, put together training materials and all of that, but it really sort of um, just focused on here's what the features of the system are. It didn't look back at where the users were and really try to, we treated them, and this is um, from what I read, a very common thing where people tend to treat their users as if they're blank slates. Instead of going in and really trying to understand what that gap was between where people started off and where we really needed them to be to understand what was going on with the system. So after we transitioned CFDA, and it was a fairly small system, so um, so all things considered, um, it went reasonably well. We did bring in some FBO users and we showed them how we had transitioned CFDA and said, will this work for you too? And they said, oh no, we need much more than that. So we did, we did a little bit more than that. Um, we went in and we created a whole landing experience where we went in and, um, and explained to them what was going on a lot better. We provided some links to different things that we thought would be most useful. But to a large extent, this effort was still somewhat external to, to the system itself. It was, it was something we built on top of the system as an afterthought. It wasn't really any sort of anything that we built into the system itself. And it was really sort of as we got closer and closer to the FBO launch that we really started to sort of recognize that we needed to be a lot more intentional. So as we started looking at some of our future transitions, we started really looking at, okay, what does that actually mean to be more intentional? So some of this um, that I'm showing you here actually comes from a, a book. Um, it's kind of a classic text on, on innovation by Everett Rogers called Diffusion of Innovation, where he really does a deep dive, has lots of case studies where he's really looking at how quickly people adopt and accept innovations and what are some of the attributes that, that really affect whether or not um, people are going to accept something or a project is ultimately going to fail. Because a lot of times, you know, the technology you have might be great technology, but really getting people to buy into it and see it and, and accept and move forward um, is, is a lot of times where the failure comes. So the first attribute he really talks about is um, how do you increase the perceived advantage of the new solution for and you see I've got user in brackets there. Um, again, huge believer that um, that you don't um, not to use the generic um, reference to the user, but really as you're doing this, identify a specific user, a specific problem you're trying to solve for them, and then express how to increase that perceived advantage in those terms. But but this was this was the first one that um, was on the list, really looking at um, and and focusing on how how do you not just the um, the advantages, but but how people perceive them, and asking people how they perceive the change. Um, compatibility. I'm going to go and do a deep dive into in a little bit, um, but really, this is about how do we provide an experience that's compatible with the values, past experiences, and needs of the user. This is going in and really drawing on that history drawing on their habits, drawing on their understandings of, of, in our case, our legacy systems, all the visual cues in those systems that they are so used to having. And it doesn't matter that the new system might be much better than the old one. There are certain visual cues that they have been working with for years. And all of a sudden, we're asking them to unlearn that. So how do we take some of those visual cues and really move them forward and, and leverage those as we're transitioning them? Another important factor is, um, is the complexity of the change and really understanding what the complexity of that change is. We have a, um, a reporting tool from fpds.gov that we've been in the process of, of bringing in. It's a third party tool, bringing in a new tool, loading all of our data into it, and then um, making that available. And, and that's one area where we're really understanding how people perceive that complexity um, 
is really important too. And I'll talk, I've got a screenshot in a little while and I'll talk about that some more as well. But really people's perception of the complexity of the change and how do you get them over the, the hump and really understanding and, and dealing with that complexity. And a lot of times it is just, it's perceived complexity. Uh, the fourth one is, um, is, is it possible to make things available for people to try out, to experiment with? beforehand? Can they go in and, you know, kick the tires and get comfortable with it before they're actually required to use it? And then the last one, observability. Um, this is really a lot about whether or not the effects of the change are something that other people will see. So uh, what the examples that are used in the book are cell phone use, for example. Cell phones are really visible. You have them out on your person, they ring, they're disruptive, all of that. So if you're a brand new cell phone adopter, it's very visible not only to you, but to the people around you. So that's really about other people being able to tell that you've adopted this change. All right, so I'm gonna go into an example here, and this is really focused on, on the compatibility and whether or not what we're doing is compatible with the expectations and history that people bring. So we did a lot of focus groups and interviews and things like that before we started transitioning our systems. And in almost every single one, one thing that we heard over and over and over again was some form of the request, I just want a Google-like search. So if you see what we have here, it's probably a little bit more like a shopping site because it does have the categories. You can see um, all award data. It's kind of like when you're shopping, you've got different departments. And if, if I wanna shop you know, for Harry Potter, I can shop for Harry Potter across an entire site, or I can look for Harry Potter in books, I can look for Harry Potter in movies, in toys, in clothing, right? But again, a Google-like search um, to us really meant that you could type in a location, you could type in an ID, you could type in a keyword, any number of a variety of fields. You just type it in and the system figures out what you're looking for and gives you the most relevant result. And then from there, you can further refine it by category, add additional filtering if you like. But, but this is what people said over and over and over again. We want a Google-like search. And this here is a screenshot. Um, this one here happens to come from the, the current SAM.gov, but a lot of our legacy searches looked an awful lot like this. So you've got this box here that the, with the heavy black outline. And that would be on one page where you'd have some sort of quick search that maybe went against one or two fields. And then a couple of, uh, you see the DUNS number, a couple of IDs. And then you'd have this idea of an advanced search which took you to a dedicated page with lots and lots of boxes of different things that you could filter by. And people were really used to this idea that they have an advanced search and that advanced search is an entire page of stuff to choose from. So when we brought them over and, and gave them what we thought was a Google-like search, people would start off, they would search across all award data. And the first thing that they would run up against was, where's the rest of my filters? They were used to having this, this entire page where they had lots and lots and lots of filters. And we heard, bring back advanced search, my filters are gone. So the filters weren't really gone we did what was similar to a lot of shopping websites where when when you search across the entire site the number of filters that are available that are applicable across all the different departments if you will um, or in our case the different modules um, it changes so that if you're shopping for shoes versus toys versus videos the filters might vary as you narrow in they get more specific so the filters were all still there, but our users were not making the connection because we didn't have an advanced search page anymore. This, you know, the site behaved like, uh, we looked at so many different websites. We looked at, you know, at who was highly rated 
and we look at the behaviors and this idea that you go in, you start a search with a few keywords, and then you progressively narrow your results more and more to get a more refined result as you go. It's what everybody was doing, but people were not making that connection. So this is where we really needed to ask, okay, how do we take this search that looks like so many other searches that have best practice that are considered best practices out in the world? How do we take and make that more compatible with the past experiences that these users users had? Because there were certain visual cues they didn't see anymore, and it, it confused them. So to help with this question, we held workshops and we used a clickable prototype. So we went and and just it was a, it was a skeleton of a prototype. And you can see you can see the size of the um, if you do the math on those numbers right there, you know, 26 people in one group and um, uh, two groups, 26 people, that's roughly 13 people per group. So with a lot of our user engagement, we tend to go a little bit higher in number of people than recommended, sometimes a lot higher. The um, number of people that we have that are interested that want to participate, we, we actually get really good response, a lot of people that want to be there. And so we tend to have to fill up our sessions a lot higher um, just to make sure that we get everybody included. But the way that this worked was that we had this clickable prototype and we asked for multiple volunteers from each session to take turns working with the prototype and this was you know this was after everyone went virtual this spring so this was done all virtual um, so we asked different people to share their screen we gave them a link to this prototype and we asked them to take turns clicking through we would give them a scenario like, um, suppose you want to find a contract opportunity, we'd give them an industry code, a product code, and say, okay, um, go, go, go see if you, what you can find for us. And so the person who was volunteering would take, um, work through the prototype, anybody else who was in the session could take and help them out. Um, they could go in, they could type into the chat, they could use voice give them suggestions if they got stuck. And we watched people navigate this prototype to see what visual cues were missing for them. So if you look at, um, look back to the original, um, the original site that we launched, the search bar was a lot more prominent and people went directly to the search. There was a couple problems with that. One, they were getting stuck and not finding the advanced filters. And the other one is that the search is only across the award data. It is not a full site search. It doesn't search the help. It doesn't search into the reporting areas. We were on Google Analytics and we were monitoring what people were putting into those search criteria. And an awful lot of the search text that people were putting in was topics that you would look for in a help section. So where originally people were going through and trying to find stuff through that search, we de-emphasized it and we put the contract opportunities, um, uh, this, this tile right here, and we found people then were going straight to that tile and drilling into contract opportunities. So, so what, what this really is doing Where our initial thinking was that we have this integrated search, we want to emphasize this integrated search and this capability to search across everything and get people really thinking in terms of these functions like search and reports and, and these big consolidated areas. We were really taking a step backwards and to, to when these systems were siloed. So each one of these tiles really represents one of those silos that people are comfortable with and they're used to. And when we first started working on this project, I heard this phrase called paving the cow path. And someone from our governance said, you know, whatever you guys do, you know, we don't want you paving the cow path. And, and what she was really saying was that, you know, we were bringing in processes, a lot of which were paper processes 30 years ago that somebody had automated 
without really refactoring the process itself. So it was just an automated version of a paper process. And, and, and our guidance had been all along, no, if, if we're gonna go in and do this modernization, we really have to modernize it. We can't pave the cow path. But by going in and, and really sort of replicating a little bit of the experience of those siloed systems, we're kind of doing that. We're taking that, that old cow path and putting a little bit of paving in place, at least temporarily, to get people you know, it's a little bit counterintuitive, but to get people past that initial change. We have not backed down at all on, we still have the global search. You can see there's a, a main menu item that gets you to it. There is a shortcut here. These are for power users to get to these capabilities that long-term are the capabilities that we really want to feature. But as we're making them more powerful, as people are getting used to this, we're very much going in and saying, okay, you know what? People are really used to having these siloed systems. Let's replicate a little bit of that experience for them, at least in the short term, to get them through this transition. And when we went in, prototyped that, and put it in front of people, they gravitated to that, navigated through that, and provided us a lot of really good feedback. But we could see that comfort level that people had with. With, um, with that little bit of, of familiarity that we were, we were giving them back. And this, this right here um, is an illustration then of, of this was what we showed them during those groups. They gave us a lot of great feedback, told us places where they wanted us to tighten things up, rearrange things a little bit. And you can see then based on that, this is the next iteration. Um, again, a really iterative process and we'll do then some, um, these, these groups just happened a few months ago. So we'll do some additional usability testing now on, on this as well. But you can see here where it, people who are used to that legacy, you know, siloed system contract opportunities was FBO, can click on that. This here um, is a part of a much larger landing page that also has a lot of other links to all of the, the old contract opportunities functionality. And you can see they've got a dedicated search that just takes them to the contract opportunities already pre-filtered. It's part of that global search, but the dropdown has already been set to, to just restrict it to contract opportunities pre-filtered. You can see an advanced search button. Again, that advanced search button takes them to the same place they could get to other ways, but just by using that visual cue of advanced search lets them know that that's going to take them to where the filters are and they can get directly to those, those filters that, that they associate with an advanced search experience. So it's not the same advanced search experience, but it's the filters and that just that little cue there gets them there. So this is the, um, the reporting tool that we currently have right now. It's on our beta site. Um, it's, it's fully live. People can use it today. Um, we really considered it to be live back in March. And right now what really is keeping it from being authoritative is this change management piece. And, we, you know, and one of the things, you know, looking at some of our previous transitions um, that we looked at was, okay, how do we give people more time? All of our sites, we had functionality out there. We had an alpha testing, um, but really that full finished product, we didn't leave out for people to play with for a very long time. So we looked at, okay, how do we give people more time to try and experiment with this to help ease that transition. So we did that, we put, we put it out there, we said, you know, we're gonna give people a few months to do this, um, the, then the pandemic hit and people were caught up in all of the contracting related to the pandemic and so we pushed that date now to the fall. And one of the things that we learned is we put this out there for people to play with, we put up notices on on the legacy FPDS that all those reports were being transitioned. Um, on, the, on the SAM.gov site, which is where they were transitioning to, we put up all kinds of notices, as much communication as possible. 
and we noticed that people still really weren't playing with it that much. And, and I think what it came down to really was the complexity that people perceived that it had. So we went in and, you know, we got some initial feedback that it was hard to use. And so we, again, scheduled usability sessions and we sat down and, and looked at what users, and we'd already been through alpha testing and all of that and, and had been told that, that functionally it was fine. Um, but then, and those initial alpha testers, you know, were, were fine with it. But, but then when we actually put it out there for a large volume of people to use, we weren't getting any takers. So we sat down and we watched people go through and, and once people got started with it, we noticed that they were fine. Once people got, you know, a, a report started, once they started adding some data to it, you could see, you could see them, that we could actually observe like their, their attitude and their posture and their whole approach to it, where they were not confident at the beginning that they knew which buttons to push. And with each button click, you could see that confidence grow really, really quickly. So it really became a question of how do we get them over that initial hump um, where this is a new tool. And, and if you look at the, um, the data down the side, those are all the different categories of data. So there's about 500 columns of data in this as well. So again, this was a complexity. And so we went out, reached out to the, the vendor of the tool and have been working with them to create a whole bunch of samples to put out there because the real change management problem with this one is complexity. How do we give people some simple reports that build their confidence really quickly and a couple of videos that help them through that? And if you look at this, you can see um, as, as we're moving forward, this is, we've been tracking how many reports people are running. And you can see right now, we have about the same number of people now that are using the new tool, that are using the, um, the old one in FPDS. And so this is something that we'll be tracking over time. And, and as we're going forward, um, we're starting to do things like train the trainer events. Um, we have a lot of force multipliers out there. We've got small business counselors that um, are run through a program that DOD funds where we can go in and, and, and really have these force multipliers to see really how much we can get, you know, that trial, um, people using the new tool as much as possible before it gets shut off. So that's what I have um, for my examples. And I think I'm staying right on schedule here even. Um, so I guess you just really want to summarize that Again, it's it's never too early to consider how change impacts your customers, and really, um, this idea, you know, you know, looking back, it's it's a little bit like you know the tooth toothpaste issue, where in hindsight, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, where you think, well, why wouldn't why why would it be hard to um to to make that leap in in brushing your teeth? Um, you know, in, in hindsight, 2020, you know, there are so many of these things that, that, that you think, well, of course you should be doing them. But, um, but for us, I think it was really sort of a mindset change in, in understanding that, that this change management really is an intentional design process. Um, and that really needs to be embedded in the framing of our problems. It needs to be embedded in all of the user analysis that we do. It needs to be embedded in the design and it needs to be embedded in all the feedback that we get once we've delivered something to make sure that we're really intentional, not just you know, about what the end state of our system should be, but really what are all the incremental steps that we need to take to bring people along with us so that they become partners really in making these changes as opposed to really feeling like victims of them. So um, with that, I think we have uh, time for questions. And Wonderful. I've got some great questions from the chat box, including, um, 
a question. How did you know that leading customers through change was the overall challenge you were working with? Um, gosh. So, I think, I mean, there's certainly, it's certainly not the only challenge that we have. Um, if you can imagine, it was, it was really the one that wasn't getting any attention. And uh, a lot of it was really just through hearing users say over and over again that this isn't like what I'm used to. And I, I think, you know, and initially our reaction to that was we knew it wasn't like, you know, we knew that we were asking people to accept something that was going to be vastly different. And we kind of felt like, you know, it's going to be worth it in the long run, just hang with us. And, and I think we heard enough times people say that, you know, but it's really not what we're used to that I think it really sorted to over time, this idea grew more and more that, you know what, there's a whole lot more that we could be doing to, to iteratively soften that landing for them. Uh, you know, as opposed to sort of accepting that change was going to be hard and we would have to get through it together. Let's, let's see if we can actually make that change easier. Several so, people have commented yeah. on the cow path and paving the cow path a little bit. When you were talking about that, you mm -hmm. mentioned several times that it was for now or yeah. temporarily. Is there a plan to depave that cow path eventually? I think that's going to be a matter of, of really listening to, um, you know, we're, we're agile. This is a multi-year project. Nothing really happens because, you know, we're government wide, right? Um, so when, when we change things, you know, we've got 90 contract writing systems and millions of users, and we've got governance from, you know, 24 CF, um, CIO agencies. So, so, when we say iterative, our iterations, you know, for some of this is, are, are pretty big. Um, so, so the short answer is we don't know yet. Um, and I think a lot of that's really going to be driven by the feedback. Uh, and because we have so many different users, they use our system in ways that we don't anticipate. And because of that, I think, you know, a lot of that's going to be driven by, by how this thing evolves. Um, so short answer is we don't know yet. Now, when you were talking about the workshops you did with the clickable prototype, you, it sounds like a focus group instead of individual usability types. And Jim Fox wants to know, what did you gain from having the interaction among participants of a focus group instead of individual usability tests? Um, a lot of it was really them feeding off of each other and you know, places where there was consensus, places where there was disagreement, and, and we got to hear them discuss with each other. We have a lot of really knowledgeable people that, that use our systems. And so you're kind of, um, you're kind of sort of, uh, you know, a mouse in the room listening to a bunch of experts debate how things should be. And so a lot of it really is, you know, and I don't want to discount individual usability testing because I think you get a lot of really good fine grained feedback from that. But, but the, the listening to people sort of feed off each other and, and debate things and, and all of that, um, it's, it's a different kind of feedback, but, um, but it's, it's, it's really rich discussion a lot of the time. Would you do it the same way again? Uh, I would. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and again, I'm not saying that, that that replaces usability testing. I just, you know, there's a lot of complexity to our systems. You know, we're not building shopping apps. There's policy implications. There are operational in implications across a lot of different agencies. What works for one doesn't work for the other. And so a lot of times when we get people from those different backgrounds in a room together where they can come to some consensus, then then they're coming, you know, we're not, it, it, it helps us to not, we have to synthesize less. And some of that process of synthesizing different user input, uh, you know, we've got a bunch of subject matter experts kind of synthesizing amongst themselves. 
and then we can take that and run with that. Um, so it, it, it saves us some analysis, actually. Wonderful. Kathy Irville says that she likes the box on the home that asks if the user is new to the system and asks how much of the Gideon step-by-step -step instructions includes before, after, versus a clean, this is how it works now. Is putting a help me get started area on the site sufficient? So that new to Sam section is actually, um, it's an experience that we saw at um, Customs and Immigration, I believe, first. It was a few years ago that we first ran across what they had done where you could go in and you could fill out, a, you know, have a few different check boxes sort of indicating who you were, and then they would tell you what you could do at the site based on who you were. And we thought it was a really nice experience Experience, but it was kind of buried on the site. You had to really dig to find it. And we had the opportunity to reach out and talk to the team that, that developed that and ask them if that was intentional, that it was so hard to find, you know, why they didn't make it more prominent. And, um, and they'd said that, that they were in the process of making it more prominent that they had gotten really good feedback on it. And, and we, so we, that is something that we also put into those workshops and got that, that experience there actually got the highest reviews of anything we put in front of people, the, the most positive comments, the most positive feedback. Um, so what that experience is, is you go in and, and broad categories of users that we have, we have federal and non-federal users and we have people in the contracting community and people in the um, assistance or grants community. So that experience is, is going in and asking people, okay, are you a, are you a federal user or a non-federal user? Are you a assistance user or are you contracting? And then based on those broad categories, we give them a list of, of options, things that they can do on the website. So it, it's very task oriented. Um, it's, it's, it's the opposite really of, of paving the cow path. It's, um, it's giving people the perspective, you know, we, you have the, the, the search, the database uh, or data bank, um, really that functional organization of the site. Then you've got that um, domain, um, you know, contract opportunities, um, assistance listings, that organization of the site. And the new to SAM is actually based on who the user is. And it's really orienting the site based on, on who you are. We have more questions about the focus groups for usability that you ran uh, mm -hmm. from Daniel and Tiersa. And wondering, it sounds like they brought a lot of great information from the really knowledgeable and very process and policy oriented users. How do you then bring in the voice of the more general user base? So that, um, I mean, that continues to be a bit of a challenge for us. Um, people, you know, those really small businesses have a lot less time. Um, and, and so this really is where we rely mostly on those force multipliers we talked about. The, um, there's a, a procurement technical assistance centers is the DOD program in, and DOD funds. There's about 300 different centers across the country um, where you can go in for free if you're interested in doing business with the government and you can sign up for a counseling session and they will help you register in our system. They'll help you get started with contract opportunities. And a lot of the best input that we have on those small businesses really comes through those centers. I've been out to, there's a center at George Mason Enterprise Center uh, out in Fairfax, Virginia. And I've gone and signed up for the classes that they give and sat through alongside of small business owners who are new to the government and listened to what they were taught, what the, the counselors taught them, listened to the questions that they had. And, and that's really been our primary resource for, for that type of activity is working with those centers. They've hosted a few sessions for us as well with small businesses, but, um, but, but they've been a, that's, that's been our best resource. Wonderful. We do have time for a couple more questions if the audience has any more to 
to throw out. Otherwise, I will say there is still time to register for the final session. The link is in the chat. You can also sign up to be part of this community of practice or any other community of practice. Christy, you've been a wonderful speaker and you've taken these questions with great aplomb. I want to thank you for being with us today um, and helping us have a great summit. Do we have any yes. more questions? Is there anything else you would like to share with us, Christy, before we part today? Um, just a really big thank you to everyone who's participating and, and also to, um, to Wendy and Jean for, for hosting this event on, under extreme circumstances. So thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. And I hope to see all of you at our final session in just about an hour. See you then. Have a good rest of your afternoon.